Great. Thank you, Emma. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar presenting on actions to improve local air quality. This is part of our Ozone Garden Network webinar series. And my name is Julie Malmberg. I am the Assistant Director at the UCAR Center for Science Education in Boulder, Colorado, and looking forward to doing this with you today. So first off, I wanted to acknowledge that the Native peoples and whose ancestral homelands we gather and whose land our bioindicator gardens are grown in. We recognize the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. And our plan for today is to do some quick introductions of our team, some Air Quality 101, talk about how to find local air quality measurements, talk about the importance of solutions focus when we're talking about air pollution or air quality, um, talking about spheres of influence, then talking about solution examples, and then having discussion. And first, I wanted to introduce our team. We have a very active team of um, people from all over the country, and that includes from CSU, UCAR here in Boulder, um, also Denver, and then on the East Coast as well. So um, we come from different agencies and organizations to support this network. And we're really glad that um, we can do this work. And our work, a lot of this work is funded by an award from the NASA Team 2 um, award function. So we also appreciate that funding in order to do these um, webinars and support for our gardens. So first, Air Quality 101. What is air quality? It is the level of pollutants in the air at a time and location. And the EPA in the United States is really interested in looking at ground level ozone, particle pollution, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide. These are not an exhaustive list of, air, of pollutants, but they are the ones that are most tracked in the US. And the picture here on the, on the right shows a picture of Denver. And the top image shows a much clearer image than the bottom one. So you can see the impacts of air pollution. This is called a brown cloud in this area. And cleaning up the air actually leads to huge visibility differences and you know how people feel in this area. I want to talk about sources of air pollution. We have human-made, which can include things like vehicle exhaust, um, coal burning power plants, industrial sources agriculture, um, plains, and then we also have natural sources that include volcanoes, fires, and dust storms. I'm currently in Colorado where we have quite a few fires burning that are really affecting our air quality. And so these kind of things we actually can visibly see when we actually have pollution sometimes. Not always, but we can sometimes. And um, I also wanted to mention that our human-made sources have a much bigger impact on air pollution than natural sources. So even though we do have things like a visible fire and ash and you know the, from that, the invisible sources from humans are actually much more impactful in this area. And our ozone one is an interesting one. So we have ground level ozone actually is not emitted from any sources, but it actually comes from a reaction between nitric oxides and volatile organic compounds and sunshine. So when we have these um, nitric oxides or volatile organic compounds released from cars um, or from exhaust, they then will react in the sun and produce surface ozone. So this is one is an interesting one because it's not a direct um, source of pollution. And what impacts air quality? There are different things. Some are more obvious like pollution sources so in order to have um, you know, really good air quality, you need to have fewer sources of pollution. Also geographic features. So topography, like being in a valley of a mountain or um, being across from um, a lake from a high pollution area. Also weather, including winds and temperature. So when we have um, strong winds bringing pollution into an area that can definitely impact the air quality and also time of day. So I have a, a graph here on the right and on the um, x-axis, we're looking at time. So it goes from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then on the y-axis, we're looking at ozone concentration, so O3 concentration. And the thing I wanted to point out here is that you can definitely see an increase in ozone concentration in the afternoon, which makes sense because in order to have surface ozone, you need to have the sources and also that sun to have the reaction. 
And then another part is interesting about this one is this study was conducted in um, Toronto and they were looking at how lake breezes or breezes that come across from the lake impact ozone concentrations. And they learned that having um, this lake breeze bring in air from a more industrial area led to a, a pretty big increase in the ozone concentration. So again, this is showing that impact of wind, temperature, and time of day. Then I wanted to talk about how to find your local air quality measurements. And for this, um, we are going to look at airnow.gov. This is a website that is um, created by the EPA and also working with partner organizations in order to ma maintain this. And the image on the bottom, that map, shows all of this, like, the locations that provide air quality data to, the, to this website. And I took a screenshot of the um, air quality earlier today, um, actually about noon mountain time. And you can see we're currently at an air quality index is that now cast AQI of 131 or unhealthy. And we're actually headed towards the red area today um, because of our, again, surface ozone and also the um, fires. So if we have time now, I'd like to encourage all of you to go to this website. Emma put it in the chat or in the chat, the link to the website and go ahead and tell me what your air quality index is right now. And I'll show you where to get to that website. So if you put that airnow.gov in and you can put your zip code in. And so see if it's updated or not. It's like ours still from 12 p.m. But yeah, to so go ahead and share in the chat what your air quality index is. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, it's 131 in Denver also, and ozone's 93, which is, we can see the ozone here, if I scroll down a little bit, um, also 93 in Boulder. Okay, well, if anyone wants to share, we can, please feel free to do so. We can keep going with the, the webinar. I also wanted to talk to you about how air quality is, is measured. So we mentioned the air quality index of being 131 here, but what does that mean exactly? So it's broken down on a scale of zero to more than 301. And this is going from green being good up to maroon being hazardous. hazardous. And that is saying that right now we're, we're in orange here, it's unhealthy for sensitive groups. So we're gonna get later to unhealthy for the general public. Um, and hopefully won't go past that. But there is this scale, if you can see how the air quality index is looking for ozone and particle pollution. And um, yeah, this is a great way also color code to see, thinking that you know red is, is hazardous, the one to be, be aware of that, and then green and yellow being much more moderate. Um, okay, another one in here. The air quality in Atlanta currently is 78, which would put that in the yellow, so acceptable air quality and ozone of 45. So again, probably not acceptable area. And I would encourage you to look at these um, throughout the day too. You can see actually how the air quality does change throughout the day, depending on, you know, if it's windy, if there's sunlight, if there's um, currently big sources of pollution. So again, check this page out, you know, the airnow.gov frequently to see how it does change over time. And I also wanted to mention local air quality measurements. As I mentioned earlier, um, we are working with the NASA Tempo mission. So the NASA Tempo has been launched and will soon start sharing data with us. And that actually will be hourly measurements during the day. So we'll see much more frequent from space, you know, are looking at our, our air quality. And we also have two other ones that are um, currently sharing air quality measurements, including Sentinel, which is the European Space Agency, and GEMS, which is in South Korea. But having those ground-based sources like the, the EPA has around the, the um, country, as well as from space, really provides a broader network of what we can learn about our air quality. So switching topics a little bit, I wanna to talk to you now about the importance of doing a solutions-focused um, discussion about how to address our air quality. 
And these resources here really look more at climate change, but also are relevant for air quality as well. And this is um, a study that CLEAN did. I'll talk about more about CLEAN in a second, but it is a network um, looking at climate literacy and energy um, network. And they found that in youth, that um, most people are feeling sadness, fear, anxiety, and all these emotions that are really quite powerful and not very positive until you get to optimistic and indifferent at the very bottom. And a lot of people think that humanity is doomed, that um, they're very worried, and the future is frightening. And so there actually has been a fair amount of research and methodologies in how to approach this, because we actually are in a place where we can work towards solutions together and make a huge impact. So CLEAN, which I just mentioned, um, it's Climate Literacy and Engineering Awareness Network. They have mental health resources that are pretty fantastic for using with talking to the public, talking with communities, talking with schools, um, to really encourage people to move beyond doom and gloom towards empowerment. And I know this is a small image here, but I did want to uh, call out three different items on here. For their strategies, strategy four is encourage and take action, including um, working together and on and you know coming up with solutions and ideas. Number five is join and create community and connection, which these ozone garden network or ozone gardens are a great place to have a community. Um, and then also cultivating hope and resilience. So sharing examples of hope, sharing success stories, sharing things are, that are positive and working towards um, solutions. And it's reframing from eco-anxiety to eco-compassion. So again, thinking about how we present information to our, our communities. And the link for this is available on, um, on the left. And also the resources slide at the end that has a link in it as well. I would encourage you to look at these resources if this is something that interests to you, but it tends to be pretty helpful with figuring out how to frame and share information about climate, air pollution, and so forth. So one of the first parts in thinking about solutions is thinking about spheres of influence. So when thinking about spheres of influence, I have it really, this is adapted from a field guide to climate anxiety, which is a great book to look at for when thinking about talking about um, solutions for um, climate or, or air pollution. And um, thinking about areas that the individual can control or the community can control. So again, one person can really have an influence over um, you know, their, themselves and also their community. And some people and some organizations do have more influence on these different areas or different spheres. So we're gonna go through these by sphere um, and we're actually gonna go from national and global for ideas for solutions in a couple of minutes here. But I wanted to mention this um, checklist for finding your solution and doing it well, which is also adapted from the book that I just mentioned. Um, so really thinking about your spheres of influence. So are most people going to be able to create international policy to address um, air pollution? Probably not. So when thinking about these kinds of ways that we can make an impact, thinking about what people can actually do and make an impact. Also, ecosystem time diversity and so do solutions. A lot of different solutions work together to actually to a bigger solution. So it's okay to do different things and work on different solutions um, depending on what is relevant for you and also what is relevant for your community. A third one, which can be hard for a lot of people, is accepting messiness. Mistakes happen, things aren't perfect. Um, it's maybe not immediately how you want your solution to be. Um, so just accepting that and embracing that and acknowledging that you know making a difference can be a really good first step. Being aware um, or be wearing of perceived inefficacy here. So if you don't see immediate impact, it's probably okay. You know, again, these things do add up and in the long run, there can be um, impact. That again, mentioning finding positive stories and cultivating hope, super important there. Um, valuing your time. So when to say no, so you can be fully present when saying yes. Definitely um, doing something really well. So that value quality over quantity, doing something extremely well will have more of an impact than um, doing all the things, but not very well. And this is something that I struggled with in the past. Like I have to do all these things. I don't know what I need to do. And there's so many, I felt overwhelmed. It was just doing one thing well at a time um, in order to address my, um, how much 
a pollution I was creating or um, what I was doing in these kind of situations. So let's now go through the solutions. So this first one here is looking at solutions on a national and global scale. A few things I want to mention are clean up legislation, support renewable energy initiatives, and also international cooperation. And this map here on the right is from the EPA, and it shows um, transport in water by different kinds of boats or ships or cargo ships and so forth. And um, it, you can see like the example of tankers are in, in red, so carrying oil, um, gas tankers are in green, vehicles um, are in, vehicle carriers in magenta, so shipping cars across locations are magenta. But anyway, what I wanted to point out here is that you can see that all these ships, one, produce air pollution, and two, they don't stay in a certain location. They're going all around the world. So if one country makes a, a change in emission standards, for example, it's going to have some impact, but not really impact the entire ecosystem here. So countries working together to actually create standards and energy efficient energy efficiency rules and standards actually can make a, a really huge difference, these kind of things. But it does require the international cooperation. Next one is looking at technology. So um, one is air quality monitoring systems, which again, NASA Tempo. This is something that was developed by scientists and engineers and researchers and people who are very smart in these areas in order to better measure air quality and, and surface ozone. Um, so yeah, those are those images here from NASA, um, the logo and also an, a, a drawing of the satellite there. A second one are smart city solutions. So think about when you're driving, if you hit every single red light, and so there actually are ways to um, mitigate that. And cities can actually manage traffic flow and reduce congestion through these smart city ideas. Um, so technology allows people to do that. There are sensors, there are ways to monitor traffic and monitor um, you know, what's happening in the cities in order to have the traffic move better. And then next we have looking at agriculture. Um, industrial agriculture pra practices. So this is thinking about adopting cleaner production technologies, um, implementing sustainable farming practices and reducing open burning. And the image here on the right is from Product Drawdown. It's a great area to look for solutions. They have a whole lot of solutions on that, on this website. And for this one, um, I wanted to mention that Product Drawdown is a great way of like what you can do in order to support this and also benefits from this. So with looking at regenerative agriculture, you can actually support local farms or farms that are doing regenerative agriculture. And that includes compost application, covering crops, crop rotation, doing no-till, reduced tillage of the soils, um, and then also organic production. And then if you actually are in, in the farming, um, working with extension offices or other people to help you figure out the practice that's best for your farm. And there are a lot of other benefits from this too. Not only does it reduce air pollution um, sources, but it also you know, can lead to healthier soil, um, higher productivity for farms, um, more nutrient dense foods, um, and then also wildlife um, has a better chance of surviving around the area. Okay, then we have getting a little bit closer to our own individual spheres of influence, looking at local policies. So I wanted to mention here that some things that happen in local policies are like enforcing emission standards, supporting public transportation, improving land use, um, and also developing renewable energy programs. So I have a picture here again from Drawdown of a walkable city. So there's a lot to be done that can support walkable cities. And there's been a lot of research recently talking about what that actually means. So some people think if you have a sidewalk, it's walkable, but actually in all reality, that's not quite the case. They definitely help, but if you have a buffer between roads and the sidewalks, if you have a green space or if you have a median, some way to provide that, that safety area. Um, if there is um, a good option for nonstop walking areas, so if you have to, if you're walking on a sidewalk and it stops, you know, the walk, the walk ends, it's not gonna be very walker friendly or user friendly for, for pedestrians. So definitely creating that way for people to get from point A to point B in a safe manner. Also making sure that there's appropriate lighting, that there are, um, you know, it's it's 
their trees for shade to make it not quite as hot on the walks or to provide cover from rain. Um, so yeah, so thinking about what walkability actually means is an important part of local policy. Then we have community. Some of the things that can happen on communities are smaller scales or enhancing green spaces, promoting active transportation, this is biking and walking, um, and also community engagement, like our ozone gardens, um, supporting other ozone gardens to develop is a great way to do this. And then education and raising awareness. This can again be through the gardens, but having workshops and campaigns. And I wanted to mention two things on this one. One thing that communities can do is promote biking to work. So in Colorado, we have, or actually in Boulder, we have a pretty active bike to work day and they have um, stops along the way, like, you know, from areas of like more housing to more business areas with like baked goods or free bike things or um, other things to encourage biking and also their competitions for to see which businesses can have the most bicyclists on a certain day. And that actually has led to a lot more people biking. So they've, they've done research and found that having these days has led to more people biking to work consistently. So creating the opportunity, also peer pressure is wonderful for getting people to do things, which can be not positive, but also in this situation can be very positive and seeing other your peers doing similar things or in a, in a very um, effective way. And then the picture here is from the Green of Detroit organization. And this organization actually works to buy up abandoned lots of houses in Detroit and plant trees. So the city of Boulder, or sorry, city of Detroit and also um, the state of Michigan supports Detroit in doing this and is taking a lot of these areas that did not have anything on them and putting trees. And I talked to people doing this a few years ago and they mentioned that, you know, some of the trees can actually lead to income sources for people. So they're looking at what's um, healthy for creating crops that have fruit or um, syrup or other ways to turn these into sources of income, along with, you know, improving the local air quality. And it creates a great environment in the, the community in order to have it look nicer with, rather than abandoned houses or buildings to have trees and green spaces and working together and meet your neighbors and so forth. They've had a really positive impact from this. So again, that's Green of Detroit you want to learn more about that one. Then I have a few slides for individual solutions. And I wanted to re-emphasize for this that I have a lot of solutions listed here. And all of these may not work for you or your communities. But I wanted to just encourage you know, to consider what would work for you or your communities. And when talking to people visiting gardens about this or talking to people in your community about this, thinking again about what you can do well. So do you have to do everything on this list? Absolutely not. If you can, wonderful, but maybe you can't. And so I just want to encourage, again, figuring out what you can control in your individual sphere and then what makes sense for you to be able to do well and also taking care of yourself in the, and as long, along with creating the solution. So for adopting clean transportation, you can choose to take a, um, a bus or a subway, um, a train, and again, as if it's available in your area, carpooling, um, is a great way. I believe right now, most cars have on average like 1.4, 1.5 people per car. And so there's a, a goal to have that increase to over two people per car. Um, and that actually make a pretty big impact on our, our local air quality. Then biking and walking. Again, it's, um, you know, making sure it works for you, but to walk to work, walk to the grocery store, bike to these different places. Electric bikes also are great. The picture here is electric bikes. And um, I would encourage you to look at Drawdown because it does you know, weigh out the pros and the cons electric bikes that they they are much better for the environment than driving a car, for example, um, but they're not quite as good for the environment as walking or biking on a regular bike. However, the benefits of them definitely outweigh the negatives as far as local air quality. They also um, encourage you to turn off your car when parked and avoid idling. Um, a car that's idling for one minute actually produces more carbon monoxide than three packs of cigarettes being smoked um, at the same time. So that's how much idling in car can impact you. Oh yeah, thanks, Anika. E-bikes are better than e-cars. Yes. So um, we want to encourage uh, with the next one on there is high electric vehicles that these are definitely better than um, 
regular cars, but then kind of going down like the list that electric cars are better than these vehicles, which are better than, um, and then you get to the point of like biking and walking is better. And then properly inflating tires. So for this, if you have your tires are too flat, you actually lead to less fuel efficiency. So I'm just keeping that, that maintenance on your tires. It's a pretty easy one to do is make sure your, your, the air in your tires is properly inflated. Okay, and more individual solutions, thinking about your home now. Um, so some things to do here, you can look at adding insulation. You can look at air drying your clothing, um, replacing air filters, checking your, the seals around your doors and windows. If you um, notice that you have leaking air around your doors or windows, sealing those off can really help with your, your home air, um, local air quality. And also looking at energy efficient appliances, LED light bulbs. Oftentimes, um, energy LED light bulbs are provided for free from different companies and areas. So check to see if you can find free light bulbs actually in your area. And also your thermostat setting. So for example, if you set your... Um, Temperature is higher in the summer and lower in the winter that can help your, your energy consumption and therefore your, your <clears throat> pollutant sources. Um, and the picture here is looking at insulation. And for this one, an added impact besides just making, um, you know, being better for not creating as much pollution, you actually can pay less money if your energy bill is less. So it has another benefit of thinking about your, your home's insulation. Then other individual activities are thinking about your outdoor spaces. So planting trees, limiting fires, and also using electric or hand-powered lawn equipment. I listened to a podcast recently. It was on 99% Invisible, which is a great podcast. And they're talking about um, leaf blowers in Los Angeles. And it was an interesting story because initially in like the 70s, leaf blowers became very popular. And people um, were like, these are so bad for our noise levels, not even acknowledging the you know air quality implications of leaf blowers. These were the gas powered or diesel powered ones. And it turned into a huge thing where people were like, you know, we can't, we can't have these loud leaf blowers happening to serve my sleep, to my kids sleep. It's just not a great thing. And so they had a lot of town halls and, and meetings about this. And eventually they passed a law saying that, hey, no leaf blowers that are, you know, diesel powered or gas powered leaf blowers. Those are the only things that sit at the time. And the people who did landscaping were like, hey, this is my source of income for this. this is how I actually make an income is through landscaping and using these, these leaf blowers save so much time and efficiency that I'm able to get a lot more done. And so it ended up being a law that was on the books, but was never enforced. However, when people started learning that, you know, actually these leaf blowers are really bad for our local air quality, they were able to refer back to this law and start enforcing and thinking about other ways of um, having lower impact on air pollution sources, like through these hand-powered or um, electric leaf blowers. So an interesting story about how um, people look at, you know, the, the, the sources and the solutions, I don't know, these type of things. Also encouraging to purchase locally sourced food. When available, um, this has an impact of less transportation and less, therefore, you know, air pollution emitted through traveling across the country or from other countries. Um, initially, looking at ballot initiatives and sharing information. So, seeing what makes sense for your community. What do you think that would be a positive impact on your community for um, it's on the ballot? And then additionally, supporting political candidate positions on environmental policy and regulations. So, seeing which candidates in your area support environmental policy who supports regulation. So really doing some research on political candidates. I know that many organizations can't promote candidates. So I'm not saying to say a certain candidate, but more just just see what candidates are supporting and talk about that component. And the picture here is from the Boulder Farmers Market, um, which is a really fun event in, in Boulder. We have every Saturday and every Wednesday night where people can come buy food from local farms. And it's quite a celebration also to, um, see performers and art and your neighbors and community members. Okay, so now I wanted to talk to all of you about what actions do you do to promote? Um, and this can be individually or working with your gardens. And what do you see your community members doing to promote um, improving air quality? And 
Emma, I will turn this over to you now. You're talking about the unmuting or um, coming on camera, that part. Yes. Um, I am going to allow attendees to talk so we can have a discussion um, and other panelists on the call, you're welcome to join in. Um, I would you uh, would you like me to keep the recording going, Julie, or do you want me to? You know what? I'm going to share the reference slide and then let's Great. go back to this one and stop recording. Sounds so good. here is the resources slide. If you want to see anything they talked about today, I wanted to include this information. We have what is air quality? It's a um, learning zone article on our website. It is geared towards a middle school audience approximately. So it has language that's pretty easy to understand. We also have a link to our ozone garden overview. Um, and then I include the air now, the EPA link for local air quality. Then those clean mental health resources. And then finally, part of drawdown, which again, lists a lot of solution ideas, um, not all with air quality, but for you know thinking about um, climate change as well. So air quality and also climate change in general. So please check these out. If you have questions also about this, please let me know. Um, and yeah, so let's get back to this one and you can stop recording. Great, thanks.